August 31st, 2021. This virtual public hearing is now considered to be open. My name is Ray Stewart, and I am the regional supervisor for the North Carolina Division of Air Quality's Winston-Salem Regional Office. I have been appointed to the, be the hearing officer for this public hearing by the director of the Division of Air Quality, Mike Abrazinskas. My purpose this evening is to receive in an orderly manner your comments, either written or oral, for consideration in the issuance of a revised and renewed air quality permit for Ecolab Incorporated to incorporate the requirements of the recently promulgated rule 15A North Carolina Administrative Code 2D.0546, control of emissions from log fumigation operations for the fumigation of logs with methyl bromide and to incorporate the fumigation of other commodities with the use of phosphine at the facility loaded, located at the North Carolina State Port at 2202 Burnett Boulevard in Wilmington, New Hanover County, North Carolina. For the sake of brevity and simplicity, the facility be, will be referred to as Ecolab henceforth during this hearing. Let me take this opportunity to be very clear. The focus of this hearing and the only focus is to receive public comments on the proposed air quality permit for Ecolab as they relate to the applicability of air quality regulations. The Division of Air Quality is conducting this public hearing digitally to allow for public participation while protecting public health under current guidance to prevent the spread of COVID-19. This public hearing announcement was published on July 30th 2021 in the Wilmington Star News and the Division of Air Quality's website. During this virtual public hearing tonight, we will be receiving oral comments from those individuals who pre-registered to speak at this event. If you are having difficulties with WebEx, you can use the chat feature in WebEx to ask questions or seek assistance. You can also visit the Division of Air Quality's website using the link in the public notice for this hearing for instructions on various ways to connect to WebEx. Joining me for this hearing tonight by WebEx are from the North Carolina Division of Air Quality's Raleigh Central Office, Michael Pajetra, Deputy Director for the Division of Air Quality. Zainab Nassif, Division of Air Quality's Public Information Officer. Rahada Sheikh, Environmental Engineer 2 with the Rules Development Branch. From the DAQ's Wilmington Regional Office, we have Brad Newlin, Regional Supervisor, and Dean Carroll, Permitting Coordinator. From the DAQ's Winston-Salem Regional Office, we have Jim Hoffner, Acting Permitting Coordinator. I want to thank everyone involved in getting this public hearing scheduled and organized with a special thanks to Rahada Sheikh and Zainab Nassif for their technical expertise in setting up the, this event. We understand that there may be local dignitaries such as town mayors, city or county officials or state elected legislators who are present at this virtual public hearing. We thank you for your attendance. The Division of Air Quality's regulations do not require a hearing or comment period for the issuance of this permit. However, Due to significant public interest, the division of the director of the Division of Air Quality has decided to open a comment period and conduct this public hearing to receive pertinent public comments on whether to allow or deny the issuance of this revised and renewed air quality permit to Ecolab. The required 30-day public notice for this virtual public hearing was published on July 30th, 2021. In addition to your oral comments tonight, the division is also accepting comments via mail, email, and by phone to a voicemail box. The email address is daq.publiccomments at ncdenr.gov. The phone number with a voicemail box is 919-707-87. One four. Copies of the permit application, the air quality permit application review, 
the draft air quality permit and other information concerning the Ecolab application are available to the public at the following locations. The North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality, Wilmington Regional Office, located at 125 Cardinal Drive Extension in Wilmington, and the Division of Air Quality Central Office Permit Section, located at 217 West Jones Street in Raleigh, North Carolina. If you haven't done so, and you wish to review these materials in person, they are available to you during normal business hours at the locations I just mentioned. However, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, an appointment is required. Please call in advance to make an appointment. A copy of the draft air quality permit and the permit application review are also available on the Division of Air Quality's website at www.ncair.org. The order of the events for this hearing are as follows. First, Dean Carroll of our Wilmington Regional Office, who reviewed the permit application and wrote the draft permit, will discuss the application the DAQ received from Ecolab for the revised and renewed air quality permit and the air quality permitting procedures. This will be followed by the public comment period. We will receive oral comments from those individuals who pre-registered to speak at this event. This will allow us to have an accurate hearing re record. Only those who have pre-registered will be called on to speak. To provide enough time for public comments, this meeting will be conducted in the following manner. All efforts will be made to call speakers in the same order of your registrations. Oral statements will be limited to a maximum of three minutes. I will call the names of each of the pre-registered speakers in order, and our WebEx host will unmute the speaker when it is their time to speak. I will also announce the names of the next speaker in the queue so they can provide their comments when their names uh, are called to speak. Please do not start speaking until the WebEx host has indicated that your microphone has been unmuted. Your time will begin when the WebEx host has unmuted your microphone. Rahada Sheik will keep track of your time and he will announce when your three minutes have expired. Please respect the time of all of those who wish to make pr to present oral comments tonight by adhering to the time limits and closing your remarks as quickly as possible once time is up. Cross-examination of the person presenting comments or me, the hearing officer, will not be allowed. However, as the hearing officer, I may ask questions to the presenter for clarification. Questions directed to the Division of Air Quality staff members will not be answered during this hearing. If you have questions for DAQ staff, they can provide you with their contact information, so you may contact them after the meeting during normal office hours. After receiving comments this evening, the hearing officer re hearing record will be closed. However, the period for submitting written comments does not close until September 2nd, 2021 at 5 p.m. You have until September 2nd at 5 p.m. to submit additional written comments. Again, the only focus of this virtual public hearing is the presentation of comments related to air quality issues associated with the revised and renewed air quality permit for the Ecolab facility and the applicability of air quality regulations. Only relevant air quality comments can be considered in my final recommendations to our division director. I will now call on Dean Carroll, permitting coordinator and engineer of the Division of Air Quality at the Wilmington Regional Office to discuss the air quality permitting procedures and permit application review. Dean. Thank you, Ray. Um, I have a few quick slides that I will start um, to explain the permit process that we did here in Wilmington. This is for Ecolab at the NC State Port at Wilmington. Today is August 31st. The proposed permit number is 10313 R03. On November 23rd, 2020, 
Ecolab located at 2202 Burnett Boulevard in Wilmington submitted an application to amend permit number 10313 RO2 to incorporate the requirements of the recently promulgated rule 15 NCAC 2D0546 control of emissions from log fumigation operations. Ecolab submitted the $400 fee on 1130 20 that would be 2020 and the application was considered complete on February 5th, 2021 after additional info responses. The emission sources at this facility consist of fumigating logs and shipping containers with methyl bromide ES1, that's emission source one, and fumigating tobacco and shipping containers with phosphine, also ES1, and fumigating bulk fruit under tarps in a cold storage warehouse using methyl bromide emission source two. Methyl bromide emissions and phosphine emissions from the containers will be vented using a fan and ductwork that connects to a 40 foot vertical stack. A permit renewal application for 10313 RO2 was also received in a timely fashion according to our rules on 216 2018, which will be processed with this application for revision RO3. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Both methyl bromide and phosphine are North Carolina toxic air pollutants and are regulated under 15 NCAC 2D 1100. In order to document compliance with the NC toxics rule, which is a health based rule, the acceptable ambient levels AALs established in 2D 1104 for methyl bromide and phosphine are 1000 micrograms per cubic meter for methyl bromide on a 24 hour time period and 130 micrograms per cubic meter for phosphine on a one hour time period. Ecolab was required to perform an air pollutant dispersion modeling analysis for methyl bromide and phosphine. Both stack emissions and fugitive emissions were considered in the modeling. Next slide. Thank you. The conditions in the draft permit for 10313 RO3 were developed under the, under the authority of 2D 1100 and 2D 0546. The conditions developed for the permit were structured according to each major step of the bulk pile and container fumigation processes. On the left side, step one, fumigation preparation for bulk piles, two, bulk pile fumigation, three, leak detection and repair program, four, exhaust stack for bulk piles, five aeration, six removing the tarpaulins. On the right side, step one, fumigation preparation for containers, two, container fumigation, three, leak detection and repair, four, exhaust stack for containers, five aeration, and six opening the containers. Next slide, please. In this permit, monitoring, record keeping and reporting requirements have been created for Ecolab to de demonstrate and document that flow through the stack is maintained and that the facility is preventing or minimizing fugitive loss to ensure compliance with the modeled rates. Thank you, that's all I have. Thank you, Dean. At this time, we will hear from those who pre-registered to provide oral comments this evening. When your name is called, our WebEx host will unmute, unmute your microphone so that you may provide your comments. To ensure our records are complete, please state clearly your name and who you are representing. Your comments will be recorded, so please speak loudly and clearly toward your computer's microphone or telephone speaker. Please do not start speaking until the WebEx host has indicated that your microphone has been unmuted. This is critically important for the audio clarity of your comments. Please turn down any speakers that you have that can create feedback. If there is significant feedback on your line, we may need to mute your call and attempt to come back to you later. If we call your name, but cannot hear you after you've been unmuted, please check to see your, if you are muted on the WebEx screen on your computer. If you are having audio issues, try a different method of audio connection within WebEx 
or use the call me feature to have WebEx call your personal telephone. If we still cannot hear you, we will proceed to the next registered speaker, but we'll call your name again at the end of the hearing. I will do my best to pronounce your names correctly and apologize in advance for any errors. As I call on speakers, I will also announce the next speaker so that they can be prepared to speak next. We will now begin taking oral comments. The first speaker will be Sharon Valentine to be followed by Leonard Bull. Yes. Sharon, Sharon, go ahead. Your line has been unmuted. Thank you. My name is Sharon Valentine, and I am speaking on behalf of the neighborhoods along the river, or Dell Webb River Lights, and I am a member of the Lower Cape Fear League of Women Voters Environmental Team. First, we want it understood that we want methyl bromide banned. If compromises are made to get some regulation approved at the expense of neighborhoods being exposed to methyl bromide emissions, no matter how the letter of the law is written into the application, the practice is not ethical. If Ecolab's application for the modification of its permit is approved, we urge it be delayed until the following concerns are addressed. One, Ecolab's application still includes methyl bromide AAL levels that are 14 times the levels recommended by the Science Advisory Board and the state toxicologist. Ecolab's request for modification of the application <clears throat> has added phosphine gas. This was not disclosed to the public. Further review needs to be done. We need to know what's coming out of Ecolab stack, where it goes, how it interacts with the river environment, how the additional emissions affect air and water quality and combine with other emissions from nearby sites. Two, Department of Air Quality must develop a stronger compliance monitoring system. The dispersion zones should be expanded to a five mile radius from the fumigation site. Air quality monitors highly sensitive to methyl bromide should be installed in each zone. DAQ, not Ecolab staff, must monitor these gauges and develop a monthly report to compare the off-site data with the monthly report submitted by licensed Ecolab personnel. This information should be shared with local health officials and the reports made available to the public. There really is a simple solution. Study shows debarking is economically feasible for pre-shipment and quarantine requirements and a safe alternative to the chemicals. It is being used at the port now. We strongly advocate for debarking. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Ms. Valentine. Our next speaker will be Leonard Bull to be followed by Arlene Stevenson. Mr. Bull. Hey, Leonard. Yes. Thanks. Leonard. Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. Go ahead. Okay. My name is Leonard Bull. I'm a retired NC State faculty at, at, and administrator from in <coughs> College of Agriculture. And I represent the, the residents of uh, River Lights and particularly the Del Webb community. Uh, my bottom line point, in case I run out of time, will be that we need to outlaw the use of methyl bromide, as a neuro, which is a neurotoxin in an ozone fold for any use anywhere in North Carolina. But if you choose to do otherwise, I have some five points that are, that are not questions, they're suggested things that need to be done. I'll get through them. If I don't get to the finish with them, they've been sent in. One. There should be a requirement that all individuals working with methyl bromide be professionally certified, and the same goes for those making measurements, sampling air and gas, or gathering data. That is not unlike the requirements for certain, uh, agricultural workers to apply and use. Excuse me, methods. excuse me, Mr. Bull. Yes, Mr. Bull, uh, your voice is coming in and out. Okay, Could let you me make sure back. you're speaking as close as you can to the microphone. Now, does that work better? Much better. Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry. 
Uh, anyway, uh, what I've requested in item one is has nothing is not unlike what it's agricultural workers have had to do for pesticides and herbicides for years. Number two, air samples must be collected continually by a percentage aliquot and any independent spot sampling by individuals to indicate uh, momentary concentration changes must be done using monitoring devices that are capable of detecting the wide, the full range of high and below levels ever possible of this particular gas. Those devices must be certified, obviously. Three, all samples taken and report data must be recorded and retained by a third party in a legal chain of custody. Company employees are not to be used to collect data or samples. Four, test of the dispersion and deposition arc must be done for methyl bromide, as Ms. Valentine has pointed out, exiting from the proposed 40-foot stack and into the atmosphere. At several locations, suggested that they be a 360-degree circle of, of at least five miles in, in all directions from the stack. Uh, I'm not particularly certain that that 40-foot stack is, is tall enough, and I would call your attention to the fact that a chimney on the top of a, an elder house in downtown Wilmington on a two-story house with a full attic and chimney in the middle at the top of it is about 40 feet from the ground, so use that as a reference. And number five, if a model is used for any of the air content estimates, the statistical standard of error for that calculated data point must be provided. And physical structures, et cetera, should not be used to determine the dispersion characteristics of methyl bromide in this area. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Mr. Bull. Uh, before I call on the next speaker, I do want to remind everyone that, uh, including the speakers tonight, that you are invited to submit your your what you're using as oral comments, as written comments to the email address provided earlier. Um, if you don't, uh, especially if you don't feel like that you had enough time to get your comments in, but we invite you due to the limitations of, of, of perhaps sound uh, and that sort of thing to, if, if you've prepared written comments or you're reading for from a script for your comments, please feel free to submit those to the email address, they must be submitted by no later than September 2nd at 5 p.m. Thank you. All right, the next speaker will be Arlene Stevenson to be followed by Keeley Wood. Ms. Stevenson? Yes, this is Arlene Stevenson. I'm getting feedback. <laughs> I'm here to represent myself. I'm a River Light homeowner. Um, I have concerns about methyl bromide, primarily health concerns that you're all aware of, and because they're requesting approval at such a high level. I'm looking at this issue from three perspectives. As the homeowner on River Light, as a former neighbor of a DuPont chemical plant where I lived one block from the fence, I came out with my legs, died from the Delaware River, I had paint removed from my, my car and every car in town from something coming from the smokestack. And I had my high school windows blow in and, and uh, several kids had to be taken to the hospital in Philadelphia. Uh, as a result, and my father was an employee who obtained asbestosis as a result of it. Um, also, I'm a former regulator, like some of you folks. I was the deputy health officer of the state of Maryland, and at the Department of Health, I dealt with these issues, including anthrax, mosquito spraying, pesticides, small cancer, small area cancer cluster. So methyl bromide has been banned from most countries because of the impact on the ozone and the health concerns. U.S. News and World Report has shown that for this area, the risk presents to hum humans are in addition to the higher airborne cancer risk, the higher air hazard quality, and the higher unsafe drinking water than the remainder of the state. We're also at higher risk because we live in a very humid area. Air particulate sizes increase. They get heavier, they fall toward the ground, and then the impact 
plants, animals, and the water quality. And I just wondered if any of those issues will be considered. Um, there are a lot of questifies, questions that need clarifying. Um, if the company is exceeding standards, how is the notification made and by whom? Um, is there an option of using the reverse 911 system that the county has? Also, um, there was an economic analysis, a health equity analysis conducted, but was there a health impact analysis? I wondered if any of the changes that were made related to Trump's executive order relaxing environmental standards impact um, the issuance of this permit. Also, how is our county health department involved and are the city and the county county council involved? I wonder if Ecolab will be willing to be a good neighbor and a good employer and would they self-report to the county if they knew they exceeded limits in an excessive release? Um, and that could prompt an activation of the reverse 911 system. Um, there are alternatives. Um, the pollution controls could be put on the containers. They could do business with different countries that don't require methyl bromide. Excuse me, Ms. Stevenson. Yes. Ms. Stevens, uh, your three minutes to speak have ended. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, I, once again, I invite you to submit additional written comments to the email address by 5 p.m. on September 2nd. Thank you for speaking today. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Keely Wood to be followed by Daisha Williams. Hi, my name is Keely Wood. I represent my family. How many talks and toxic compounds do we have to allow dirty industry to release in the air in Wilmington to support China? Eco Labs is on the table tonight while Chemors for a third time is being cited for being out of compliance. Obviously, fines are not preventing them to follow the rules. Dirty industry is alive and well in North Carolina. It always amazes me when companies buy out other dirty industries and go with a friendlier sounding name like Eco Labs, buying out Royal Pest or Research Fumigation, giving that impression they are eco-friendly so far from the truth. 152,000 people in New Haven, Blandon, Columbus, Wayne counties are at risk at unsafe exposure to this neurotoxin methyl bromide. 72% are low income. That in itself is a social injustice and unethical. Since the last census, Wilmington has grown by 18.3%. They're expected to have a population of over 314,000 by 2040. How many more people are you willing to expose to these toxins? Odorless, tasteless, and toxic while depleting the ozone. This toxin is banned in 197 counties, countries through the Montreal P Protocol. Over a nine year period, around 130 tons is going to be released. A third party should review all monitoring and it should not be self reported by Ecolabs and they should have added testing around a five mile diameter, like they said. We know methyl bromide causes problems in central nervous systems and respiratory failure in humans. Has DHSS done an impact health study on the asthma percentage rates around this facility? Roughly three times heavier than air, methyl bromide disperses outward, downward, and breaks down slowly. We are discussing air permits, but what about the ground and the aquifers? It can pool around a facility or neighbor's yards. The cumulative impacts are real. Please deny this permit and make North Carolina safer. Thank you, Ms. Wood, for your comments. Our next speaker will be Daisha Williams to be followed by Dr. Robert Parr. Ms. Williams. Hey. Hello. My name is Deja Williams, and I am the environmental justice manager for Clean Air NC. 
Um, first, I would like to echo the comments made by our executive director, June Blotnick, yesterday during the flowers timbers hearing um, and commending the DAQ for creating the ambient air level for methyl bromide as a first step um, in regulating this highly toxic chemical. However, this is not enough. Um, without the implementation of a strong compliance monitoring and reporting program, the disproportionate burden of health risks will continue to be placed on low income and minority communities, which constitutes a clear environmental injustice. Um, in the two census tracts near the dispersion site, number 107 and 108, more than 50% of the communities earn less than 35K a year. Um, and census tracts 109 and 202.02 .02 also have high proportions of their population who make less than 35K. Um, and it is also worth noting that Tract 107 also has a high BIPOC population with a substantial number of residents of that community over the age of 65. And that tract also shows a high propens propensity of uh, for individuals with a disability. So we recommend that additional attention is paid to Tract 107. The DAQ should educate the community that this modification has been filed and community members should be made aware of and be able to participate in decisions that will fundamentally affect their quality of life. Environmental justice is a priority for both the Biden and Cooper administrations. The continued use of methyl bromide in low income communities of color constitute, constitutes a clear violation of these priorities and therefore effective solutions are required. Short of an immediate halt to the use of methyl bromide, these impacted communities can better be protected from injustice through the implementation of a rigorous monitoring program that provides transparent reporting. DAQ has the opportunity to make a decision that improves the lives of vulnerable North Carolina communities and sustain our natural resources. Adequate monitoring and reporting requirements would help protect and equip the surrounding community against exposure. Thus, we really urge you to do everything in your power to protect public health when issuing air permits for facilities using methyl bromide. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Our next speaker will be Dr. Robert Parr to be followed by Joel Porter. Dr. Parr. <clears throat> Dr. Parr, if you joined in by phone, please press star three so I can identify your line so I can unmute you. Go ahead. My name is Dr. Robert Parr. I am a retired emergency physician who has lived in Wilmington for 38 years. We are gathered tonight due to the dedicated work of the North Carolina Department of Air Quality, which has been outstanding in this matter. It has been 30 years since the new hazardous air pollutant in North Carolina has been regulated with a first time acceptable ambient level and the department is to be commended for their service to the community. Over the three year course of this matter, the New Hanover County and Columbus County Health Departments, the New Hanover County Commission, Wilmington City Council, legislative officials, Deb Butler and Harper Peterson and numerous environmental organizations have joined thousands of citizens voicing their combined concerns over the archaic and dangerous use of methyl bromide in close proximity to established communities and commercial businesses. Their unified concern was supported by the North Carolina Science Advisory Board and multiple members of the Environmental Management Commission. Make no mistake, methyl bromide is a highly damaging neurotoxin which depletes the ozone layer, has been linked to severe, acute, and chronic medical illnesses, and has been banned in 197 countries worldwide, yet is allowed for use in Seven Springs in Wilmington, North Carolina. The new AAL is a significant step in the right direction, but it does not go far enough. The originally proposed emission limits have been seriously weakened by a political industrial compromise forced upon the general public by a small fraction of the Environmental Management Commission. Until this hazard and air pollution is totally banned, much work remains. Realizing that this permit will be granted, the following conditions are requested. Real-time fugitive emission measurements should only, should only rely on rigorous monitoring protocol using detectors measuring escaping gas in parts per billion and not limited to devices only to zero parts per million, 1,000 times less 
sensitive and medically prudent. To avoid lapses in reporting over the course of these parent permits and to improve public engagement, monthly emission reports should be made available to local health departments and private citizens. We are left with one question. Why would Ecolab, a company that claims to every day make the world cleaner, safer, and healthier, protecting people and vital resources, force itself on local communities using outdated hazardous air pollutant when safer technologies such as log debarking are readily available for the export of logs from North Carolina, all while maintaining our economic vitality and protecting our public health and welfare? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Parr. Our next speaker will be Joel Porter to be followed by Peter Joyce. Mr. Porter. Yeah, hey, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Thank you. Great. Good evening. I'm Joel Porter, the policy manager of Clean Air NC. I'm here to comment on Eagle Labs, Eagle Labs request to modify their existing air permit in New Hanover numbered 10313R03 in order to comply with the ambient air level levels for methyl, methyl bromide and phosphine. Inhaling methyl bromide, even at low levels, can cause severe health conditions, including headaches, weakness, sore throat, nausea, and neurological effects. High exposure can damage the eyes, skin, lungs, kidneys, and central nervous system. This is dangerous to any any community near a fumigation site employing this toxic chemical, but it is especially dangerous and ethically haphazard when used in proximity to an elementary school, which it is. Earlier today, I brought home a beautiful new daughter from the hospital. It was my first. While there are times when a not in my backyard mentality is not realistic or appropriate, this is not one of those times. While I'm not physically near the fumigation site, the experience of today's wonderful, <clears throat> excuse me, the hindsight of today's wonderful experience cements my belief that fumigation with these chemicals should not be used in anyone's backyard. We therefore oppose this modification request and ultimately the use of these chemicals should be ceased. DAQ should give serious consideration to implementing a rigorous monitoring and reporting campaign to safeguard community health. The faculty emits methyl bromide from stacks just 40 feet in height, as has already been mentioned. They are far too short for the toxin to safely diffuse before reaching the surrounding residential areas. The permits conditions anticipate that they will nearly hit 100% of the AALs for both phosphine and methyl bromide. Yet, as Dr. Parr just noted, the monitors used by the company do not come close to being sensitive enough to pick up the dangerous levels of chemicals. When AALs were being developed, the SAB suggested using a monitor that can detect emissions at parts per billion. The, the permit modification suggests the company will use a handheld monitoring device that is sensitive to only parts per million, far less powerful than what the SAB recommended. If this chemical is to be used at all, a robust network of monitors running continuously across the dispersion zone can provide an early warning of where and when methyl bromide concentrations reach dangerous levels. We also recommend that fence line communities are notified of their access to regular monitoring reports and that those reports are sent to the county health department. We thank the division for hosting this hearing, but urge you to do everything in your power to protect public health when issuing health permits for facilities using methyl bromide. Thank you, have a good evening. Thank you, Mr. Porter. Our next speaker will be Peter Joyce to be followed by Heather Hilliker. Mr. Joyce? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm trying to make several points on the permit and they'll, they'll not be connected as such, so please bear with me. Uh, first, I want to point out that the EPA Clean Air Act, Section 112C, does not list methyl bromide as part of a source category for a toxic air pollutant as required by the Clean Air Act. Thus, the derivation of the authority to regulate methyl bromide under the Clean Air Act is missing because methyl bromide was not put in is not part of a source category. If it was part of a source category, then all of this would change. So I, I suggest that we take a look at that. 
Uh, second, uh, I'm the president of Value Recovery Incorporated. Website is valuerecovery.net. And my company has two commercial installations that destroy the emissions of methyl bromide, one at the Port of Miami and one in the Pomo, California. Port of Miami imports blueberries, asparagus, and grapes. The one in the Pomo, California exports broccoli. Uh, these have been operating for over five years. The emissions we've destroyed are over uh, 750,000 pounds in that period of time. We are considered the best back best available control technology in the state of California, having passed three independent California-sanctioned source tests showing emission control of over 93%. The evaluation of permits in the state of Virginia for a similar operation when oil was operating there, the state of Virginia Department of Environmental Quality reviewed this technology and determined that it was applicable to logs being fumigated in the state of Virginia. So I don't know the difference between the state of Virginia and the state of North Carolina, and I'm wondering why the same logic is not being applied there. So anyway, I suggest that uh, uh, someone look at this technology, and I'm gonna put forth a, a, a challenge, and that I will pay 50% of the expenses of someone to go down and visit my facility at the Port of Miami. And I'm gonna write you a check tonight, because I suggested this over three years, to go down and do that and evaluate that system. Okay, another point, I'm looking at this permit application response and the drawing that I'm getting from them, uh, from uh, Echo Labs, is so poorly drawn, no flow rates, no emission controls, no um, uh, instrumentation of any kind. It looks like it was drawn by a 10th grader. Uh, this shows a very uh, uh, callous attitude on the port of Echo Lab in terms of this permit. And finally, uh, Echo Lab is cited by Bill Gates, of all people, as a uh, uh, a very good uh, environmental company. Nothing could be further from the truth in allowing a permit like this to go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Joyce. Our next speaker will be Heather Hilliker, followed by Ashley Daniels. Ms. Hilliker? Hi, my name is Heather Hilliker, and I'm providing comments today on behalf of the Southern Environmental Law Center. First, I would like to thank the Department of Environmental Quality for providing the community an opportunity to speak tonight and for all the work that DEQ has done over the past several years to get methyl bromide regulated as a state toxic air pollutant. Although SCLC and others strongly believe that a more stringent limitation on methyl bromide should have been adopted by the state, the regulation still provides some protections that wouldn't exist otherwise. This was the first time that North Carolina had added a pollutant to its toxic list in almost 30 years, and it was a much needed step forward. That doesn't mean, however, that our work is done. Methyl bromide remains a highly toxic chemical and ozone depleting substance that poses many hazards to people's health and the environment. As has been made abundantly clear tonight, the local community remains concerned about the adverse health impacts that are known to occur even with low level exposure to methyl bromide. While I want to acknowledge the steps taken by the new regulations, North Carolina needs to move towards a complete ban on methyl bromide. In addition to state action, companies like Ecolab need to listen to the community and take whatever steps it can to alleviate their concerns and eliminate exposure to methyl bromide and other harmful chemicals. Non-chemical alternatives to methyl bromide fumigation exist and have been used by other companies in the state successfully. After receiving extensive opposition from the community in Delco, Malik Brothers withdrew their request to use methyl bromide for log fumigation and have instead successfully operated their business using debarkers. In contrast, Ecolab has used this permitting process as an opportunity to essentially double its use of toxic chemicals by adding the use of phosphine, another highly toxic pollutant. While I understand that Ecolab has conducted air modeling to demonstrate compliance with both the methyl bromide and phosphine limits, these limits were imposed without consideration of the risk of concurrent exposure to multiple pollutants. I joined the community in the press that have been made tonight, and I urge Ecolab to embrace a chemical-free alternative and transition their operations to full debarking. While understanding the limitations imposed by the pending permit pro process, 
I hope that the state takes heed of the concerns expressed here tonight and the concerns that have been repeatedly expressed by thousands of citizens throughout the state and helps move the state towards a full ban on methyl bromide. In the meantime, DEQ must ensure that Ecolab's operations are rigorously monitored using devices that can accurately capture emissions at parts per billion and that the results of such monitoring be re reported transparently to the public. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Silliker. Our next speaker will be Ashley Daniels to be followed by Harper Peterson. Ms. Daniels. Hi, my name is Ashley Daniels. I um, am here tonight representing myself and want to thank you for facilitating this meeting tonight um, and also taking time to hear the concerns of our community. I want to acknowledge the implementation of the ambient air level in the state of North Carolina as an incremental move to support community protection. I do want to reassert that during the public hearings that brought about this rule and brought about this ambient air level, the original ask was the ban of the use of the chemical methyl bromide. The use of methyl bromide does not become favorable or less dangerous because less is used. The ask remains the same that the chemical methyl bromide be banned, especially if the chemical does not have to be used. We also know that there are options available, such as debarking, that are favorable and again um, available to companies. And want to echo the concerns of both. Um, Ms. Hilliker, as well as Dr. Parr, in saying that uh, if this permit is to pass, it should be properly monitored um, in the suggested way. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Daniels. The next person to speak will be Harper Peterson, after which I will uh, ask Rahada Sheik to facilitate, since we have a little bit of extra time, um uh getting uh, other folks who may be listening in on the call who would like to speak i'll ask him to facilitate that but before he uh, begins that the next speaker will be harper peterson thank you mr stewart can you hear me yes i can thank you thank you thank you for this opportunity allowing citizens uh, to express their concerns about this very toxic and deadly chemical uh, as former state senator in 2020, I introduced Senate Bill 737, uh, asking methyl, for methyl bromide to be banned in large fumigation operations in order to protect the environment and the public's health and safety. The speakers before me have articulated, I think, the concerns I have, as I stated in this bill, and uh, since this bill's uh, filing in 2020. Uh, I would like to raise a concern. I don't know if it's been raised tonight or if uh, your division has considered this, but I'm concerned about the workers uh, that operate the fumigation chambers and sites and the risk that they are put to with this uh, acute and chronic inhal inhalation uh, potential. Uh, is there protocol in place either by DAQ, NCDEQ, NC OSH, Office of Safety, and, and, uh, and also the National Federal OSHA? Um, I think this is critical because these are not only workers for the company, but they are our citizens as well. And it's essential that we, we protect those interests. So uh, I would like a response to that, if not now, uh, as part of this permitting process, I think the most strict uh, uh, guidelines and testing uh, monitoring needs to be implemented to protect not only our public, which we, I think, have, have uh, clearly uh, revealed are exposed, uh, but also those workers on site at any and all plants. So I continue to oppose methyl bromide uh, we know that there are healthy alternatives, not only debarking, but safe uh, fumigation uh, chemicals. Uh, and again, I implore the department and the division uh, to pursue that in the near future. Thank you again for your time and your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. 
At this point, I'm going to ask uh, Rahad Ashik if he would to uh, uh, facilitate um, the ability of perhaps other attendees of the public hearing who would like to speak. Um, Rahad? Sure, thank you. Um, so at this point, uh, for those of you who have called in by phone, uh, if you would like to speak, uh, you can press star three. Uh, and for those of you who have joined by computer or mobile devices, uh, you can just use the raise to hand uh, the uh, raise of hand feature on WebEx on the bottom right corner of your screen. Um, at that point, I would uh, unmute your line and call on you to um, uh, to uh, uh, make your comments. Thank you. Anyone else? Not at this time. Okay. Uh, that is all the names that I have for those who have pre-registered to speak. If you did not register to speak, but still want to provide comments on the issuance of this air quality permit to Ecolab, Remember, there are several other ways to provide comments until the end of the comment period on September 2nd, 2021. I also want to take the opportunity to remind each of the speakers that you are welcome to provide any co uh, comments you made uh, during this hearing. You can also provide those same comments in writing. Among the ways that you can provide comments until the end of the comment period include, you can call 919-707-8714 and leave a voicemail message with your first and last name, whom you are representing, and state your comments on the proposed permit. Or you can provide written comments until the comment period ends on September 2nd at 5 p.m. To provide written comments, please email them to the following email address. DAQ.publiccomments at ncdenr.gov with Ecolab NCSPA in the subject line. You can mail written comments to the address listed in the public notice. You can fax written comments to 910-350-2004. Please address the fax to Mr. Dean Carroll. I would like to thank everyone for your attendance this evening and for your interest in this virtual public hearing process. Based on the information received during tonight's virtual public hearing and comments received throughout the comment period, I will make a recommendation to the director of the Division of Air Quality for his consideration in making a final decision on whether to issue the air quality permit to Ecolab. Again, I thank you for your cooperation and attendance on this public hearing and interest in the air quality permitting process. This public hearing is now adjourned.